Melissa. If you want to just open up the meeting, then we can take over with the presentation and do the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, we'll need you to call for a vote for the um, district education committee members to um, move forward with the meeting. With the, I'm sorry, move forward with the district of innovation plan. Okay, as um, just to update everyone, we're holding on for just a moment. Many people got into the Teams meeting um, and that's my fault for setting it up two different ways, um, trying to make sure I communicated to everyone. So um, Michelle Yates is communicating with them how to uh, get into this meeting so that we're all in the same meeting together. So um, just a, a little bit of patience 
Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Or, um, yeah, a lot of people were in Teams and not in Zoom, so we're having to tell them. Oh, oh my, it says 4 to 5.30. Oh, but the Zoom says 4.30. That is so weird. How do I change it? The other Zoom meeting said 6.30. Do what? The other Zoom meeting that I clicked on the first link, it said 6.30. And then in the, when you sent the, the Teams invitation, that one said 4.30. I'm 4. Yeah, I'm right here. I can walk into Zoom. Zoom login. Okay, I'm going there. They're they're in there now. Okay, so my Zoom meeting. Okay, so I need so I need to go in. I need to change this to how how do I change it? Back. Okay, but I can't change it. Start from. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Okay. My apologies, everyone. Um, trying to set this meeting up. We have a few more people that are coming in. So a couple of more minutes and we'll get started. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Soley to um, welcome everyone and then uh, kind of let them know how we're going to proceed. Melissa? Do All right, um, our district education committee is very important and the information that our district education committee um, has to share with us is also important. On January 11th, we met with all of you and went through the process of what the District of Innovation um, process was to move forward for supporting our district strategic plan and for uh, going through some exemptions that are in legal language to support that strategic plan. We're going to share a presentation with you today to walk you through that process again and to share with you the innovations that the District of Innovation Task Force came up. So I'm gonna share my screen at this time. And I get a thumbs up if you can actually see the PowerPoint presentation. That, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, as we talked about on January 11th, the District of Innovation is an opportunity for us to pursue innovation, uh, provides autonomy and local control to our school district. We will be taking, if, if it is approved by the District Education Committee today, we will be um, posting for public information 
and making in it any adjustments that you all find in the in the plans or that our community has to offer in the public meeting uh, through a thought exchange at the end we'll make those adjustments and then we will take this forward to the board of trustees on march 11th to the, uh, 2021 this is just the table of contents, just reviewing some of the things that we're going to go through that who our board of trustees, how this plan connects to our district findings, our school board goals, what is a district of innovation, how long does it last, um, uh, the timeline, uh, and the task force, the education committee, and then what exemptions we're asking for. So as you can see on the screen, we have our board members. We also have our mission of Victoria ISD is to provide rigorous, relevant learning and life experiences so that all students contribute positively to society. The board, the, board, the community, and, and um, many of you all went through the work over the last year um, as we developed our strategic findings. And in those strategic findings, you'll find 10 topic areas and then a variety of um, belief statements that fall under each one of those. Um, inspire teaching and empower learning, digital ecosystem, effective communication, finding their end, community-based accountability, talent development, equity, social emotional learning, facilities, and community partnership. The board, after the district went through the process of developing the 10 findings, the directions, um, developed six goals. Three of those goals are related to House Bill 3 requirements. One of those goals is related to um, the strategic finding their end, if you remember that comment from our findings. The other is also related to our uh, findings, and that is community-based accountability. And then the last goal is related to the work that the school district has done with our system of great schools. What is District of Innovation? As we talked about on January 11th, this was a concept that was passed into law during the 84th legislative session in House Bill 1842, allowing eligible Texas public schools to obtain exemptions from certain provisions of the Texas Education Code. And when we look at the word allowing eligible, eligible means that a school district must be rated a C or higher in order to be um, eligible to uh, apply for this particular exception. The law allows traditional independent school districts more flexibilities um, and available to Texas open enrollment charter schools. And in order to access these flexibilities, we have to write a district of innovation plan. How long does it last? It is a five year um, award. And um, as I mentioned at the District Education Committee earlier. The um, Commissioner of Education does not approve this. Texas Education Agency does not approve this plan. This plan will be approved by our school board and submitted to the Commissioner of Education. As long as the district holds its um, accountability ratings at a C or higher, then they are eligible to operate under this District of Ed Innovation Plan uh, for the five year period of time. If we look at our timeline, we started back early January with presentations to this committee. We held a public hearing at our January 21st board meeting. We also uh, presented a resolution to our board of trustees with all of our board of trustees uh, signing that particular resolution and approving, approving uh, the pursuit of the District of Innovation status. Of course, we have our task force meetings. The task force has met numerous times to review areas that we want to make sure that we have uh, exemptions from to help support our strategic plan. We have to present um, in a public forum, which is this particular meeting to our DEC and our public. This uh, recording will be posted um, this afternoon uh, on our YouTube channel as well as a thought exchange link so that we have community input. We must post that for 30 days, um, gathering that feedback. And then of course, we also will make notice to uh, notify the Commissioner of Education that we are planning to move forward uh, with the District of Innovation Plan. 
our school board um, will vote on the plan March 11th. And then of course on March 12th, we'll send the plan once again, as it has been approved by our school board um, to the commissioner of education. This is just a list of the task force members. And I wanna say thank you to Selena for um, most of the task force members are made up of district level administrators, but Selena Perez, our district education committee member from Patty Welder, uh, volunteered to also be on this particular committee. And then of course we have our important district education committee members. So looking at what exemptions, um, as the task force reviewed various exemptions, they wanted to make sure that it met the, the ideas of the strategic plan. And of course, this is a local innovation plan and it seeks uh, exemptions from provisions that are found in the Texas Education Code. So you can see that we have identified 10 different areas for exemptions. And we have task force members here with us today who will be sharing um, information about each one of those. So I'm gonna keep moving forward and I'll move the slides forward. And I think our first um, innovation, Ms. Tammy Nobles will be talking to us about um, certification requirements. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Good afternoon to all of you. I am going to walk you through three separate uh, District of Innovation exemptions. The first one, as Dr. Carroll mentioned, is certification requirements. There are three sections of the Texas Education Code that apply to certification requirements that are listed there on the screen. The first one being that a person may not be employed as a teacher, intern, trainee, librarian, aide, administrator, diagnostician, or school counselor by a school district unless the person holds an appropriate certificate or permit issued by the appropriate state agency. We are asking for an exemption to that requirement and I'll explain the rationale and the plan in a moment. The second um, exemption or part of the education code that we are asking for an exemption for consideration is school district teaching permit which states that as a school district, um, we can ask for a school district teaching permit and employ a person who does not hold a, a school district, uh, does not hold a teaching certificate if we have that school district teaching permit. Um, to be eligible for that school district teaching permit, um, we uh, must make sure the person holds a baccalaureate degree um, and this subsection does not apply to a person who will teach only career and tech education. Aligned with those same uh, sections of the education code is 21.057. That has to do with notifying parents when an inappropriately certified or uncertified teacher is in a classroom for more than 30 consecutive instructional days during the same school year. Um, and for purposes of this section, we're referring to inappropriately certified or uncertified as a, an individual serving on an emergency certificate. That would justify, according to education code, a reason to notify parents or an individual who does not hold any certificate or permit. Are you able, could, could you advance the slide? Thank you. Um, what is it about these um, different sections of the education code regarding certification that inhibits our plan? Um, as I mentioned under 21003, um, we believe that the current education certification requirements in, inhibit our ability to hire professionals with industry experience to teach in our career and techn technical education CTE courses and science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, our STEM courses. In order to provide more students with the opportunity to take these types of classes and obtain um, these various industry certifications, 
the district is seeking to establish its own local qualification requirements for these teachers in lieu of what's set in law. This um, arrangement would provide realistic requirements for professionals who are transitioning from industry to a, a teaching career, but of course don't have a teaching certificate. And as you can only imagine that this problem will become more of a challenge as our innovation campuses come online in our school district. The other uh, reason that we would ask for an exemption um, from section 21.003 is when the district cannot lo locate a certified teacher for a position or we have a teacher who is teaching outside of their certification, currently we as a district must submit exemption request from the certification requirements by applying for either a temporary classroom assignment permit referred to as a TCAP, an emergency permit, a teacher certification waiver, or a school district teaching permit. And this allows for district flexibility as the current requirements and this submission process um, is quite burdensome and does not take into account our financial and or instructional needs within our district. Under section 2100, 055, um, this process requires notice to the commissioner and its usefulness is extremely limited. And additionally, the language in this section of the code can somewhat be construed to prohibit issuing a local teaching certificate, which will be needed to fulfill our, our career and technical classes as well as our STEM classes with the um, expectation of, of students earning industry certifications. The 21057, as I referred to previously, involves the parent notification. And this process, as you can imagine, or you're familiar with, does require extensive notification be undertaken when the teacher chosen for the position, um, such as the ones I've referred to, a, a career and tech position, that person has been vetted and has been selected by an interview team on behalf of the district and is shown to have a vast amount of knowledge, um, content experience. Um, if you would compare this person or this position to an experienced home builder or an architect who might be interested in teaching a building trades course, of course they don't have teacher certification but they have a vast amount of knowledge in that area. Uh, a licensed correction officer teaching a criminal justice course or possibly even a retired CPA teaching an entry-level accounting course. The explanation for what the innovation would look like um, if we were to move forward with this ex exemption basically um, and I'll summarize it um, would entail that we as a district of course would keep our high expectations for employee certification and if and always make every attempt to hire individuals with appropriate certification. But when that's not possible, uh, with this exemption, we would have that flexi a flexibility to hire those individuals that are referred to as having that vast amount of knowledge, but simply lacking teacher certification. This would also allow us to not take on the cumbersome process of submitting the exemption request to the Commissioner of Education uh, and waiting for that response. Um, and as we have been doing, we will continue to use locally developed um, plans and criteria for vetting an individual's qualifications before we would um, assign and hire that, that person. Um, I mentioned some of what's listed on this slide here in regards to candidate qualifications. Um, so I'm going to skip over that. It's again just reiterating that when they don't have a certificate that their vast amount of knowledge in their field, um, their background, their extensive time spent in a, 
a field that would directly correlate to a classroom for which we are seeking a, a teacher would uh, be the vetting process we would undertake and the rationale for why we would consider that teacher to be um, highly qualified to teach that classroom. We would also want to make sure that because these are uncertified teachers, that we were making an effort on the campus to create a partnership with teachers who are certified and could help these uncertified teachers by mentoring them um, with some classroom skills that many of us uh, are familiar with from going through a college program to become a teacher. Um, but the industry uh, certified and licensed personnel would possibly need some assistance in some of those areas and some professional development in some areas that in their previous uh, career possibly uh, didn't provide the same type of uh, PD. So we would want to make sure that the, the mentorship or the, the mentor provided to these people um, that we hired was uh, set forth by the campus. Um, and then again, because we are taking on an, ex an uh, extensive internal vetting process and we believe the person that we've hired and put before our students in these classrooms is a highly qualified person we believe there is not a need to notify parents that this person does not hold a traditional teaching certificate the second exemption that we would like to request is in regards to probationary contracts section 21.102 of the education code which states that the probationary period may not exceed one year for a person who has been employed as a teacher in public education for at least five of the eight years preceding employment by the district um, when we think long and hard about this requirement what we come to realize is that just because a person has worked in public education for at least five of the eight years preceding employment for the first time with VISD does not in and of itself justify moving that person to a term contract at the conclusion of year one. Um, a one year probationary period just is not always sufficient um, to evaluate a, a person's performance and effectiveness as a, a classroom teacher, principal, librarian, nurse, or school counselor. And I list all of those because that is how a teacher is defined by section 21.002 of the education code. Um, and therefore, it's difficult to formulate a contractual decision um, within a one-year period. And in addition, when you think about the T-tests and T-PEST, um, evaluation systems and them being growth models, sometimes more than a year is, is needed before a decision can be made about next year's employment. So basically what we are asking for is that those persons defined as a teacher under 21002 would be exempt and would possibly, um, could possibly be extended a, a probationary contract for an additional year, no more than two years total, um, even if that employee had worked previously uh, in public education for at least five of the eight years before being employed by the Victoria ISD. And please note that this would be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis per employee impacted. And then finally, the last one that I want to share with you is in regards to teacher planning and preparation time. Section 21.404 of the Education Code states that every classroom teacher is entitled to at least 450 minutes within each two-week period for instructional preparation. Um, that includes parent-teacher conferences, evaluating students' work and planning. Um, a planning and preparation period under this section may not be less than 45 minutes within the instructional day. And during a planning and preparation period, a classroom teacher may not be required to participate in any other activity. So when we think about why this inhibits the goals of our plan as a district, the rigidity of the 45 minute daily minimum makes flexible scheduling a challenge and limits opportunities for increased planning and collaboration time. What we are proposing is that 
we would continue to guarantee all teachers their 450 minutes within each two week period with a minimum of 30 consecutive minutes daily for all of those things mentioned in, in the education code, such as instructional preparation, conferences, evaluating students' work and planning. Um, but because scheduling is such a critical component for vertical, horizontal, and cross-campus collaboration, more flexibility is needed in the daily time allotments um, in order to establish and have that increased collaboration between um, educators. So we are looking at requesting uh, and implementing procedures to provide the time educators need to plan, but to allow for innovative scheduling for things such as professional learning communities. So again, I just want to emphasize on this one everyone would still, every teacher would still be guaranteed a minimum of 30 consecutive minutes daily. And on some days they may have an hour or an hour and a half or two hours. And in a two week time period, though those teachers, all teachers would still be guaranteed at least the 450 minutes um, that they have been receiving. So this is actually looking for ways to keep what we have but to add to some daily flex of, uh, flexibility um, of the number of minutes uh, allowed for the planning and preparation time. Thank you, Tammy. Of course. The next one, I believe, is uh, Dr. Bungwall. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this one, if you were on the, this committee last year, this will look probably familiar to you around this time last year. Uh, I came to you and presented this as an amendment to our prior or our current district of innovation plan. Uh, this was to give us as a school district flexibility to pursue the potential option for additional health insurance plans uh, above and beyond the TRS state plan. And so this group did approve that, the board approved it. Uh, our school district went through a process last year to look at our claims uh, experience to find out if we could offer a more competitive plan. Unfortunately, at that time, due to uh, our claims experience as a, a total group, uh, the TRS plan was still going to be our most affordable plan that we could offer. Uh, that's the case today. However, we know this District of Innovation plan, uh, as we renew it, is going to be for five years. And so, we want to maintain this flexibility so year in and year out we can continue to look at our options and see if there is a more competitive, uh, more economical plan with the same or better benefits that we might be able to offer in the future. So this one's not new. This would be a holdover from something that's in our current District of Innovation plan. Thank you. The next one has to do with the operation of schools. and. We know that Texas Education Code 25.081 indicates that we must operate for at least 75,600 minutes, um, including time allocated for instruction, intermission, and reset, recess for students. Um, the commissioner can approve operation of schools for fewer than the number of minutes required if there's a disaster, flood, extreme weather conditions, or other types of activities. Um, the commissioner does not approve reduced operation time. Um, a school district may add additional minutes to the end of the district's normal school hours as necessary to compensate for minutes due to school closures caused by any of those previous mentioned um, activities such as disaster flood. Um, and they can, the commissioner can adopt rules to implement um, the section in, in a variety of ways. Um, basically determining the minutes of operation during the school day, defining minutes of operation and instructional time. But the 75,600 minutes is a, a critical component to remember. Manner in which uh, it really inhibits the goals is that it, um, although Texas and the Education Agency Commissioner encourage innovation in the classroom, school districts receive funding on an antiquated model confined to designating accounting uh, period for calculating average day, daily attendance. Um, they, there are um, 
requirements that are very rigid in the way that things can be um, accounted for. And so um, what this, what we are asking for in this particular innovation is the opportunity to have flexibility within um, those 75,600 minutes to uh, create opportunities that align to our strategic plan for things like creating opportunities for unpaid work-based learning outside of school hours, create, create opportunities for academic learning outside of traditional school hours using blended learning models or other types of non-traditional instruction. And so this innovation would provide that flexibility um, for alternative accounting times and the ability to earn full daily average attendance for students participating in these non-traditional type programs. BISD will continue at a minimum to offer 75,600 minutes, but this exemption offers the flexibility in the design of the school day minute. The next um, exemption is not one that you're unfamiliar with. This has been the one exemption that BISD has had in place um, for five years prior with our previous District of Innovation plan. And that is the exception for the, when the first day of instruction is identified. Currently, uh, TEC 25.0811 indicates that a school district may not begin instruction for students for a school year before the fourth Monday in August. And so with this particular uh, statute, it restricts when, when we can start school just and limits it to that fourth Monday in August. And it doesn't account for helping us balance semesters. It restricts time uh, before state testing dates, and it lim limits the coordination with our university partners for students taking dual credit courses. So uh, we are asking for this innovation because we think it affords us local control uh, using community uh, collaborative committee comprised of community partners and this, this district education committee to develop an instructional calendar that really balances semesters. It aligns with our local colleges. Um, it can begin midweek. It doesn't have to begin on a Monday. Um, and it just affords us the flexibility we need to support both students and teachers with professional development opportunities and um, instruction. The next exemption is post-secondary and military excused absence. And I think Ms. Dawn Moroni is going to walk us through. Thank you. Okay, in regards to uh, this exemption, we're talking about uh, the excused absences for college, university, and military visits. On the slide, you can see that the code is, a, is referencing the required documentation. A school district may excuse absences for two days per year for juniors and seniors to determine the student's interest in attending one of these institutions of higher education. This code also refers to a district being able to excuse a total of four days for a student who is at least 17 years old and pursuing enlistment in the branch of the US Armed Services or the Texas National Guard. So we'll go to the next slide. Basically, the current limitations on excused absences or age restrictions may prevent students from gaining insight to multiple opportunities throughout their entire high school career. Greater scheduling flexibility would also allow students to visit multiple colleges. By starting these visits at an earlier age, it would give students a greater understanding of the steps needed to achieve those college or career goals. So Victoria ISD is requesting to expand age requirements and increase the number of excused absences for post-secondary visits. First, the documentation of excused absences for post-secondary visitation will be accepted for all students in grades nine through 12. Once again, remember the code said it's only juniors and seniors. We're requesting all students be included grades nine through 12. And the next slide. And finally, a progressive scale, which you see posted on the slide, will determine the maximum number of absences for each grade level if we do the nine through 12. 
And then finally, VISD is seeking to waive the four-day limitation on students pursuing an interest in the military and open that up to possibly juniors and seniors. If they are 17, they could go both as a junior and a senior if they wanted to see multiple um, branches of the military. And I think I have the next one as well, which is the exemption for minimum attendance for class credit or final grade. This code refers to, as you can see on the first slide, any student in grades K through 12 not receiving credit or a final grade unless they are in attendance 90% of the days class is offered. The law also discusses the required instructional principal plans and provisions to be reviewed by an assigned attendance committee for any student falling below that 90% threshold. So on the next slide, you'll see that this exemption will allow the district to look beyond traditional schedules, settings, formats, and we can be a district that can better accommodate students by providing flexibility and promoting innovation. Students will be empowered with a blended learning approach, utilizing technology to extend opportunities and increase communication. The rules mandating percentages based on days in class, which is often referred to as seat time, cannot measure the value of what our students have actually learned. So on the final slide, um, it gives you some examples on how we can document the implementation of this exemption. But the biggest point here is that BISD believes students demonstrating mastery of the content should determine the earned class credit and the final grade, not their seat time. And I think I have one more, but that'll be the last one for me. We have the maximum class size is our next one. There we go. Oh, did we skip it? There it is. Okay. Um, if we'll go back one more slide, I think that'll show the code for everyone. Sorry, Dawn. <laughs> That's okay. Um, maximum class size is our next exemption request in the plan. Uh, basically, the state law requires a waiver to be filed with the Texas Education Agency for any kindergarten through fourth grade classroom with more than 22 students. Parents are also to be notified if TEA approves the exceeding, uh, exceeding the maximum class size of 22. Before the school year begins, the ISD makes staffing decisions based on projected total school enrollment. Once school starts, some campuses and specifically classrooms may exceed those projected numbers. Enrollment fluctuates daily at many campuses. We often notify parents and apply for the TEA waiver, and then those classes actually return back to the 22 student maximum uh, before the waiver is even seen by TEA and approved. This exemption will not only support student achievement by providing stability, but it's also going to uh, allow students to stay at their zone campuses where they have actually established ownership in their schools. And the next slide will show how we're gonna do this. VISD values the importance of low teacher student ratio. That's not a question. And we will strive to continue to maintain 22 in all kinder through fourth grade core classes. In the event enrollment fluctuates and exceeds that limit, the district will allow classes to increase class size to just 24 students. Even with this exemption, the ISD is committed to continuing action steps to help maintain smaller class sizes by monitoring staff ratios throughout the entire year and offering additional assistance to any classrooms that actually fall below the, above the maximum class size. And I think that's my last one. I think Dr. Uh, Lawrence has the last exemption. Okay, and I've always been a big believer in saving the best for last. <laughs> so this particular exemption we're requesting as a part of our District of Innovation focuses on Texas Education Code 37.0012, designation of a campus behavior coordinator. As most of you know, that particular aspect of the code requires the campus to assign this particular function to a specific individual. We believe that the campus deserves the flexibility to really share that with multiple individuals. 
namely our assistant principals. The assistant principals at our high schools, particularly, and, and at our middle schools as well, typically divvy their student load according to alphabetics. And what we are suggesting is the same way they share the student workload, they should also share the workload as it comes to the campus behavior coordinator function. So we've had for a while now a struggle with disciplinary disproportion when it comes to our disciplinary data. And by sharing this responsibility across APs and allowing APs to coordinate the work with counselors and other administrators, they'll be able to move in the direction of transitioning away from those traditionally punitive practices to more restorative disciplinary practices. And we believe this will also help us to build a strong, healthy campus culture. And that in essence is this particular innovation. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Burns. Of course we save the best for last. <laughs> the, the next part is um, just to let you all know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, that we want to make sure that we gather all of your thoughts and your input into uh, this particular district of innovation plan. And we will be making some adjustments and changes. However, we do need a vote. Um, and so I'm from the district education committee members to move forward with collecting that public input and thoughts uh, regarding this district of innovation plan. So I'm going to ask two things of, of our um, participants in our um, presentation this afternoon. First of all, I'd like everyone to make sure they share their thoughts about this particular district of innovation plan. But I'm also going to ask that our district education committee members put in the chat um, their response as an approval to move forward or not. So if you are a district education committee member, if you will um, just put in the chat a response to this, um, the opportunity to move forward. I also uh, shared with all of our district education committee members through Teams earlier this afternoon, this presentation. So you can access the link to the thought exchange there. And of course, feel free to share um, this presentation with anyone on your campus and make sure everyone visits the YouTube channel so that they can uh, see the details of what we are asking for in our District of Innovation Plan. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that um, you all have an opportunity. So um, please remember to make sure, put in the chat your um, approval to move forward or not. Um, I'm seeing most everyone um, see all approvals there. So um, again, Please make sure that um, you share this with others on your campus, that you share this information and encourage them to go to the YouTube channel uh, to access the presentation and access Thought Exchange. I know I want to value your time this afternoon, and I thank you all very much for participating in this opportunity for our district uh, to have this innovation to have this flexibility so that we can move forward for the future. Um, as you saw on the slides, we continue to design our future and we want great things for our kids. So thank you for participating this afternoon. Mm -hmm.